One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness, fight them. Lord of the Rings Online, the MMORPG that best captures the spirit of Tolkien's world, even if too literally. I realize that There and Back Again is the formal title for The Hobbit, yet building an entire gameplay loop around backtracking seems excessive. I was just here! Yet with the onset of Amazon's Lord of the Rings MMO bearing down, does Lord of the Rings Online have what it takes to stand firm? Also, in this video is a full-length podcast featuring Aubrey the Weird One, a Lotro content creator who has played the MMO since its release. Let's celebrate Lotro in 2023 while remembering the words of Mr. Gamgee. There's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Publishing a video on an MMORPG that faithfully represents Tolkien's iconic universe feels as insurmountable as Frodo's quest to destroy the Ring of Power. I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. For example, we can judge EverQuest 2 against EverQuest, or consider the Elder Scrolls Online against any title, from Daggerfall to Skyrim. But while Lotro exists within a constellation of other Lord of the Rings games, including eon-defining classics, it's fundamentally tied to literature, but not any anthology. Rather, the fundamental fantasy-defining anchor on which most other IPs are based, whether consciously or not. Sure, Tolkien's inspiration include Greco-Roman, Biblical, English, and North mythologies, yet in terms of modern inspiration, Tolkien is fantasy canon. To this end, part of our quest is not only to view Lord of the Rings Online with respect to the tropes of its genre as a MMORPG, yet also as a visual book of sorts, preserving and protecting an authentic representation of the professor's work for over 16 years. This description of the Old Forest in The Fellowship of the Ring is illustrative of three important themes in Lotro. The leaves were all thicker and greener about the edges of the glade, enclosing it with an almost solid wall. A dreary place, but it seemed a charming and cheerful garden after the close forest. The hobbits felt encouraged and looked up hopefully at the broadening daylight in the sky. At the far side of the glade, there was a break in the wall of trees and a clear path beyond it. We can clearly appreciate the compelling and visceral accuracy with which Lotro designers have illuminatingly brought Tolkien's world to life. In fact, when I ask Lotro's community what keeps them playing, the resounding answer is the world. Not combat, not class design, PvP, or another social feature, but in particular, Middle Earth. This took me by surprise, since most Guild Wars 2 players likely would not cite Tyria as their answer, nor those who enjoy ESO, Tamriel. Now, while world building extends beyond topographic sculpting, the locations in Lotro are not only emotionally inspiring, they feel Tolkien. Consider the vast stretches of Rohan or Gondor that pull the rider into its ever-expanding plains, or the chandelier of Or, jettisoning from the top of Moria's vaulted ceilings. Feel the depravity of Mordor's repression, or the cold darkness of Minas Morgul's seething fortress. The inspiration of Minas Tirith, standing stalwart against the onslaught of Sauron. One moment you could be delving tunnels on the outskirts of Moria, to fighting door to door through the entire city of Osgiliath, or helping a local butcher serve meat to his customers, then joining children dancing in the rain. The world simply is. It goes on without you while inviting all to partake. While adventuring in Lotro is not quite a sandbox, it does not feel suffocatingly theme parkish either. In fact, the open world design can encourage players to roam off the beaten path to experience Middle Earth in their own way, honoring Mr. Baggins' legacy. Not all those who wander are lost. Even the level range of zones helps reinforce a living and breathing world. For example, the immediate zone to the east of a new area for beginning characters includes mobs whose level skyrockets above your own. And a teasing collection of ruins outside of Mossward, a new starting town, requires additional training before tackling. 
Thus, progression is not strictly linear, and you are rewarded for being adventurous, just like the experience of the original Fellowship. Adventuring can include subtle moments of implicit storytelling too. While stumbling about in Mossward, an observant player may notice a picture of the Doors of Doran on a dwarf's wall, not only forecasting the fate of your character, yet also underscoring the unspoken values of this NPC. You may only experience their ancestral dwarf home by proxy of a painting, a painted representation of an ancient memory, something they likely won't experience, yet you may. Moreover, the closer to Mordor you travel, the grimmer the reality becomes. Imagine stumbling upon a freshly raided village in eastern Gondor. Smoke arrogantly rises from the ashes of human families recently slaughtered by marauding bands of orcs, goblins, and fell beasts. Cages hang from burnt trees, filled with victims who only the day before were enjoying their last fateful moments of freedom. There are no quests here, no point of interest, simply the fact of Mordor's looming threat. Your emotional response is the content here. What you do with it is up to you. Finally, my favorite observation to highlight here is visual forecasting. I've been playing MMOs since Classic EQ in 1999, and I cannot think of a title that provides better visual teasing than Lotro. Just as the Hobbit saw a clear path beyond the line of trees in the old forest, so Lotro level designers draw subtle attention to what type of content could come next while still keeping you engaged in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of where you currently are. This is done either by sheer and staggering contrast of a towering fortress against a wasteland, the romantic glint of flickering candles basking under the dancing lights of night, a beckoning tower crying out to those who see it glisten in the distance, the stalwart confidence of Minas Tirith opposing its looming siege, to the gentle hum of city life nestled over a scenic lake. Thus, the continuous pull to continue exploring Middle-earth never seems to stop and your curiosity is repeatedly rewarded by an ever-present cycle of visual coaxing. But keeping your attention fixated is not always the designer's my precious. Your senses are allowed to not only rest, yet laze in the cooling presence of night. Day and night cycles are difficult to implement in MMOs because developers have to balance function with fidelity. Lotro has executed this dance perfectly. While to my knowledge there are no mechanical differences to playing at night, and a veteran can correct me if I'm wrong, there are experiential contrasts. Earthy tones blend together selecting for sound-based adventuring than primarily optical. Finding your way is both more difficult and easier as paths fade into the darkness, yet your destination is bathed in light. Not to mention the dancing constellation of stars that bring personality and comfort to a typically unsuspecting object. In fact, the skyboxes feel like another character in the game world. The vast ocean of clouds and flickering stars make you feel like a mere individual against its towering heights. Yet I don't believe that night's design is an accident. It's distinctly Tolkien. The night grew on and the lights in the valley went out. Away high in the east swung Remereth, the netted stars and slowly above the mist's red borgil rose, glowing like a jewel of fire. Then by some shift of airs all the mist was drawn away like a veil, and there leaned up, as he climbed over the rim of the world, the swordsman of the sky, Menel Vagor, with his shining belt. Artistry's purview encompasses more than what meets the eye. Tickling the ear is critical too, even if less obvious. While an argument can be made that Lotro's graphics show its age, its sound design stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with any modern opponent. Whether you're strolling through a festive celebration, enjoying a peaceful valley, or entering a pub, Lotro's soundscape is exceptional. There are even different combat themes for various locations. It's as ecstatic as Middle-earth itself. 
There's even an expansive music system and performance culture, something I hope veterans share in more detail in the comments. Another item to ponder when considering Lotro is its bookish feel. I don't mean its long quest dialogues or its narration in dungeons. Othrangroth, the Great Barrow, the oldest and largest of the Adain Mounds within the Barrow Downs, and home to some of the most terrifying servants of the Witch King. I refer to the distinct components popular in book genres. For example, Viewing the world through another character's eyes is common in literature, yet not frequently experienced in MMOs. In Lotro, you not only have the option to experience key moments in Lord of the Rings history as if playing another character, yet you are also brought along into the memories of other characters that help bring to life Middle-earth. Still more, the main quest follows books and chapter divisions, further emphasizing the fundamental organizational structure of Lord of the Ring Online storytelling. If I'm not being obvious enough, Lotro is closer to a graphical novel than it is an MMO. There is a reason why I kept the gameplay section of Lord of the Rings Online until now. Yes, it's a game. Sure, it's an MMORPG. Yeah, it has guilds, instances, quests, items, the standard features that one expects to enjoy within the framework of the genre. While we will give these the space they deserve, it's important to understand that they are subservient to and provide principal support for what Lotro actually is. Tolkien's magnum opus materialized in a shared virtual space. As an older title, Lotro tries to preserve the RPG in the MMO, something that most games in the genre struggle to support. While you rarely have tough choices to make while completing strings of quests, you still feel the thrill of adventure, augmented by bonafide storytelling. The pacing of Lotro is slower than Black Desert Online or Retail WoW, yet not in a way that detracts from the experience. In fact, if you are looking for an immersive MMORPG that does not implicitly suggest that you are a failure by not rushing to the endgame, then Lotro leads the pack. With that said, quests are a mixed bag. While the main quest line is engaging, most overworld quests are more or less killer fetch tasks. This is not inherently bad or wrong, yet I would rather these disappear in exchange for a naturally more rewarding open world experience. Moreover, as hinted earlier, backtracking is fairly common, yet this style is not used everywhere. The Brackwater Cave has a good circular design that not only tells a reasonable and fitting story, it also funnels the player through the experience without any additional hassle. Moreover, it serves as a compelling precursor to Moria's content. If more of Lotro's overworld was structured as so, I think it would provide a less annoying experience. Here are a few examples of frustrating quest design in Lotro. After you deliver lunches to hungry dwarves, you must then gather reagents to craft pickaxes. But we were just there, clearing out a cave moments before, so why couldn't I have picked the materials then? And since the retaking of Moria is effectively a military operation, you would imagine that efficiency is of utmost importance. But the process for the player is anything but. This bleeds into the strange dichotomy of being a ordinary hero. This yin-yang can feel jarring. One moment, you're slaying beasts of great renown. Then you are suddenly required to sharpen dull blades, or checking a bed for bugs. It would be one degree of annoying if these were entirely optional side quests. Yet each example I provided is a mandatory step to continue the main story of Lotro. I understand that in the journey of returning the One Ring to Mount Doom, that the Fellowship must have done mundane, laborious, and mind-numbing tasks but those details are even too boring to be in the canonical books. So why include them here? These items by themselves are ultimately minor, yet since you will be completing such quests for as long as you play, you will need to decide if this two-phase storytelling is acceptable. Speaking of dull blades, let's turn our attention to itemization. Equipment in Lotro is entirely standard in the MMO genre. Gear has major and minor traits, Upgrades are frequent, and the best equipment is generally acquired by completing group instances. While Lotro does have a legendary weapon system, it feels like it's better in theory than it is in practice. What currently exists is a rework of an older system that I never experienced, so I lean on veterans to fill in the gaps in the comments. As far as I know, the old system required you to level legendary items, and at certain points, you could customize their stats through various methods. In the new system, your legendary items, while not sharing your level, are tied to your level. So instead of leveling them, you level yourself, and at certain intervals, you can upgrade their level to match yours. 
Of course, at certain thresholds, additional stats or augments become available for use. The community response to the new system seems to have been met with mixed responses. The older system provided additional depth, yet with more complication, whereas the new system is simpler, yet less inspiring. Both still require leveling, either the weapon itself or your character, so the major change was how improvements to your weapon are governed. Admittedly, this trade-off is entirely subjective, yet the new version has a problem. Legendary weapons, at least starting out, are hardly better than what you normally would have looted through a typical gameplay session. Additionally, in the old system, since you had to level up your weapon, you had some sort of personal attachment to it, like a pet. The new system replaces its journey with your own, severing any emotional ties. Thus, in practice, the system doesn't feel legendary. To add salt to the wound, consider Sting, the elven blade that glowed when orcs were nearby as a result of elven anger infused into the weapon itself. Since orcs are canonically powerful, and if you were adventuring at night or in the deep darkness of caves, this benefit would be immense. Not to mention the rarity of such a blade and the fact that you happen to wield it. But instead of having this type of functionality tied to legendary weapons, glowing weapons simply exist as a cosmetic overlay. Good for accessibility, but bad for immersion. Not to mention that every character must have a legendary weapon prior to entering Moria, so their reputation is far from exotic. Thus, legendary weapons in Lotro provide little, if any, additional functionality are inherently common and have no progression system of their own. Thus, they are legendary in name only, a sad departure from what could be an otherwise excellent opportunity for Lotro to infuse Tolkien's spirit into its itemization. But even if the equipment system is relatively standard, Lotro's visual aesthetics are grounded, reasonable, and compelling. Unlike Guild Wars 2's over-the-top particles and fanciful wings worn by adventurers, gear in Lotro feels part of the world, not out of place. And while the cosmetic system is somewhat wonky, it strikes a nice balance between fashion and function. Speaking of functionality, let's consider combat. As of the most recent update, landscape difficulty options now exist to customize your adventure in Lotro's overworld. If you want to relive vanilla-like difficulty again, you can do so. Thus, the following comments target the default experience that will hit or miss depending on your selection biases. Overworld content is supremely easy, so much so that I prefer to ignore most of my class's features by turning off the UI and pushing only a few attack buttons. If you want your experience to be akin to living in the Shire, yet everywhere in Middle-earth, then the standard experience is perfect for you. But if you want to walk in the dust of Frodo's footsteps, then you will want to turn up the difficulty, because currently there are few reasons to join fellowships or groups in the open world, because the average character may as well be a Valar walking amongst mere mortals. The easy difficulty also removes pressure from gamers to learn some of Lotro's systems, such as paying attention to dread, the utilization of food, potions, or healing elixirs. These features are inspired by events in the books themselves, so it's disappointing that the game shies away from them. But combat in Lotro is surprisingly engaging when the game rewards you for leaning into your class's mechanics. For example, the Warden has Gambits. These are special abilities that can be triggered after a series of skills in a certain order have been activated. There are gambits for almost any type of situation, DPS, support, tanking, and healing. So as long as you know where the trajectory of the battle is going, you can be prepared. Moreover, captains earn bonuses to special skills after they have defeated an enemy. Prolonged battles require strategy in that you need to time the death of a foe so that it is not wasted during the bonus's cooldown, enabling you to keep riding the wave of increased damage or healing. I found this flow more important in group-based situations, although time will tell if harder landscape content will encourage the strategic gameplay style. Yet, while the RPG side of the game is not mechanically unique, Lotro's community is comparatively more vibrant. Seasonal events bring players together to celebrate collectively, including performing plays and, interestingly, performing music, both of which are firmly part of the Tolkien ethos, especially since the books are filled to the brim with singing. O oh, wanderers in the shadowed land, despair not, for though dark they stand, 
all woods there be must end at last and see the open sun go past the setting sun the rising sun for days end all the day begun for east or west all woods must fail it's this preeminence of the tolkien ethos that makes lord of the rings online so unique no it's not its combat it's not its gearing systems or even its approach to quest instead it's everything besides its genre that has enabled it to withstand the test of time despite being old enough to drive it's lotro's commitment to embodying tolkien this explains why Lotro is likely not under any real threat from the newly announced Amazon-produced Lord of the Rings contender. In an interview with Games Industry, Amazon Games Vice President Christoph Hartman said, and I quote, I definitely want to put the game first to make sure it's a great game, because, as I said, we want people to play for 10 years, and it's not going to help me if someone is saying that's a perfect representation of the book of the game. If you're really into that, read the book. Read it another five times. Otherwise, if it's a game, a game has to do with playing, and they have to be playful, so there needs to be a little bit of being able to bend the rules to make it a great game. Ironically, the very features Hartman is going to avoid are the reasons why Lotro continues to be a success. While I do hope for an enjoyable Lord of the Rings MMO from Amazon, I strongly doubt it will feel as Tolkien as Lord of the Rings Online. So, you may be wondering if Lord of the Rings Online is a good fit for you. If you are a returning player, they are working on a stat squish that will make numbers in combat far less outrageously high. A point that you can feel even now as a newbie dealing over 1000 points of damage. Of course, there are 140 levels of content to enjoy, stretching from the festive hills of the Shire to the foreboding dark skies of Mordor. As a new player, there are unique tutorials based on the race you play, similar to Dragon Age introductions. However, the free options are either dated or poorly constructed, both of which I covered in my prior overview of Lord of the Rings Online. With that said, if you are willing to spend around $20 to purchase the recently released Before the Shadow mini expansion, the newbie experience presented here is far better. In fact, I lament that this isn't given for free to new players, as it is an excellent introduction to the MMORPG in 2023. One issue I highlighted in my former video was how voiceovers in the tutorials did not align with the first line of text that added confusion when trying to follow what was being spoken versus what was written on your screen. I appreciate the voice acting, yet the reception is slightly jarring because only the third sentence is spoken. In the new content, their voice acting properly overlaps with the first lines, making it far easier to enjoy the experience. Scardy spends more time fixing horseshoes than he does forging swords. The new zones are gorgeous and represent how good Lord of the Rings Online can look despite its age. Considering the landscape difficulty adjustments and the upcoming stat squish, not to mention a new class, Lord of the Rings Online is in a great place to either return or begin anew. Since it's free to play, and since playing grants premium currency, you are also able to play to play, not only pay to play. And for those who watched my Dungeons and Dragons video, I am sorry, that title too has a similar monetization model that I failed to understand accurately. Fortunately, Standing Stone Games also frequently releases codes to unlock massive amounts of content for free. And as far as I know, completing a certain introductory quest now unlocks the ability to ride a horse, a feature originally hidden behind a paywall. So in terms of accessibility, I don't think there's ever been a better time than now to play Lord of the Rings Online. And just as the Fellowship shared honest dialogue about the highs and lows of their epic travels, I am pleased to present my interview with Aubrey the Weird One a player since Vanilla Lotro who has much to say about the state of the game. She regularly streams on Twitch and publishes content on YouTube, so please check out our content. Much thanks to her, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Well, thank you again for carving out time within your busy professional schedule to have a chat. Something I've learned in my journey in content creation, especially when I'm covering an MMO that isn't my main, I'm often making observations from the outside as a non-native, like an immigrant almost. And so I would love 
to understand Lotro better from your perspective. Yeah. So um, thanks for having me here, by the way. This is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I just wanted to no, say that. No, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So a little bit about me. I'm Aubrey the Weird One. Uh, I actually started streaming on Twitch about two years ago. And oh, yeah, cool. I was I was kind of playing like a little bit of anything variety. I did yeah. play a good amount of Lotro. So um, I did get like a good community kind of started from playing Lotro. So I just kind of kept playing it on Twitch. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of fun. Um, however, I started playing Lord of the Rings online about gosh, ever since it came out. So <laughs> I've been really? playing for several like years. Vanilla? Yeah, like, so. Are you serious? Oh, according... I, that's <laughs> awesome. I never got to. I was playing like, you know, original EverQuest and these, oh, quirky, yeah. you know, Chinese MMOs that came out about that time. That's one of my big regrets. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I'm just, I'm, no, I'm you're envious good. of your, your history. No, I love hearing about this. Yeah, so this is the story, according to my father. Um, Spoiler alert, my family and I really played Lotro together. It was the first game I ever played, so what? I was very young. <laughs> yes, That's I was like six no years old. <laughs> yeah. That so, is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was It was like the first game ever. So I, I just gravitated towards it because it was just like the first game I ever played, so I had to keep playing it, right? Oh, of course. No, I understand that. Yeah, my first game was... <laughs> very different <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that's, especially it being a family uh centered experience that's so cool yeah it's awesome um according to my father my uncle was uh one of like the testers for lotro like before even like the beta really? came out or anything oh, that's cool yeah yeah so my dad always played under my uncle's account because he had to use a special code so my dad oh, got really sure. into it uh -huh. Yeah, and then I got really into it because I always watched my father play. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. essentially made an account under my father's account because I was, mm -hmm. you know, six. So I couldn't really play oh, a game. Oh, sure. Totally. Yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the whole family got involved with it. I got my first, like, gaming PC. I think it was, like, nine. So, yeah, it was my father, my grandmother, and my uncle and I. We all would, like, do some group content and such. And now it's kind of just me. And I've kind of carried the torch for yeah, how many sure. years the game has been out like 16 years now yeah so. i think what recently or somewhat recently i well i suppose there are uh, in-game celebrations still going on for the 16th anniversary is that is that correct yeah they actually just wrapped it up unfortunately but okay okay yep. gotcha yeah i was getting special years. special currency every like every, yep. i don't know 50 mob kills or or something i still don't know yes. where to turn them in but <laughs> yeah oh well i guess you gotta hold on to them next year unfortunately but <laughs> yeah sure sure now what's, yeah. what's interesting is well there's a number of fascinating things you just talked about but you said that early when lotro was released you were doing group content now yeah was that when overworld content was balanced for groups in the open world or were there instant uh instance content uh as well yeah so we only did like instances like i never did raids i still have never raided in lotro mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. to this day mm -hmm. so <laughs> no, i'm a little either. bit behind so, same club. cool <laughs> awesome i'm not alone but yeah we always did like instances or skirmishes so it was kind of like we had like three or four people and then we just got into an instance and played along it was fun Gotcha. Now, do you recall the game being more difficult back then, or was it simply different? It was definitely a lot more difficult back then. I don't, uh -huh. I don't know I... what, like, reworks they've done necessarily to know, like, when it got more difficult, like, when it got easier to kind of grind okay. it, but uh -huh. it's definitely, I've died a lot more back then than I do now. Sure, that's interesting. <laughs> so have you played any of the... I think they're called legendary servers with the difficulty slider. If so, has that brought back any of the nostalgia at all? Or have you not touched any of those features? So I haven't tried it out yet, but I think that's... I'm... Okay. The, I think the new legendary servers that they have, like Treebeard that's around now, with mm -hmm. those landscaping difficulties and stuff, I mm -hmm. think they're a little too difficult than in comparison to the past of how it was. Really? Yeah, because, like, I see people who are on, like, plus six, like, deadly, yeah. and, like, you can't walk around without, like, essentially having to strategically think about how you're going to 
to like attack this mob and like you you can't take on like more than two enemies and back then it was like you could take on two but you had to be like a guardian you couldn't be like a light armored class like a minstrel mm -hmm. like trying to take uh -huh. on two enemies back then but interesting um, so you call yeah. it being a bit more nuanced or maybe some more subtlety with how the difficulty was balanced back then of course kind of yeah back in the uh, corridors of our memories right yeah interesting okay no that's fascinating because i i know i wouldn't say it well uh, the little bit that i've read is mm -hmm. the community i wouldn't say they're split but the, <laughs> yeah. there's different opinions of various intensities about overworld difficulty some people love that it is currently very accessible and others fondly remember it being more difficult and cl and as a result of it being more difficult it was naturally maybe a bit more social and perhaps there's some uh kind of r relational components that that people would like to maybe more naturally group in the open world um in in terms of your own playing how frequent do open world groups occur or is that mainly for the instant side oh wow um you know that's a that's a good question i don't know if i can necessarily answer because i i don't really focus too much on like open world like any of that mm -hmm. like grouping content anymore necessarily mm -hmm. now but back then i do feel like because of like the difficulties back then you you were like heavily involved with more like raids and um group content just to kind of get through like doing some of the open world stuff so um, that's just my opinion that I do feel like back then it was almost like, yeah, kind of doing more open world group content was more like pushed, I guess, in comparison sure. to now where you can, you can solo this game easily. I mean, I do it all the time now and yeah. I have no issues. Oh, for sure. Uh, <laughs> recently I've been turning my UI off. <laughs> yeah. And just, I, there's a couple <laughs> buttons I can push. Now, yep. every once in a while, if I see that there's, you know, um, what are they called? The uh, there's a deed for like the named creatures in a given area. Yep. I forget. Uh, so if I see one of them, then you know I'll toggle it back on and kind of have to think through it. Uh, right. But no, I, yeah. But I understand there's also a benefit of the game being more accessible and it being more your character engaging with sort of the, the beauty of the the world building, opposed to every second you're having to think tactically. So I I I can also see it from from that side as well. Yeah, for sure. It it was it was definitely I feel like this game is almost completely different now. And I don't know if that's when Standing Stone games took over instead of like Turbine, because um, mm -hmm. Turbine had it up until a certain year. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I almost was Standing Stone. It almost got a little easier in some ways, though. They've actually like put on a lot new, um, like a lot more new expansions and stuff. And like there's mm -hmm. so many changes to the game that are good. Mm -hmm. But with Turbine, I definitely felt like it was different. Like it was a little more difficult, more groupy content. So yeah. yeah. Interesting. I must have dipped my toes in occasionally under Turbine, but I think most of my playtime has been under Standing Stones. Now you did mention there have been changes to the game that you do like, especially under Standing Stones. Do any of those changes immediately come to mind? Um, The number one change that's been fantastic and i'm so glad they did this um which i believe standing stone put this into effect maybe turn by turbine did but i believe that it was standing stone that made it that the traits because every class has like traits uh, virtues that you have to get in the game um which you would get from like deeds but back turbine like back when they had it they had it set up that your slayer deed so like Say you have like to kill 40 slugs in the Shire and then you have to do the advanced version of that. Um, then when you did the advanced version of that deed, that's when you would get like a certain virtue trait that would hopefully go with your class. But if it didn't go with your class, like if it didn't have stats that you needed, like might, then you essentially would have to go find another Slayer deed and like hope that you were like picking the right Slayer deeds that could help you. And then you'd it have was to randomized? like- Yeah, it was kind of, cause you could, always look at like what the reward would be um sure. for whatever deed you have but like uh -huh. if you don't have the advanced deed you don't know what your oh, reward will be until you get to the advanced deed so yeah. you would have to grind to at least the advanced deed and hope yeah. that it's relevant right yep and then okay. some of them it kind of sucked for the light armor characters from my perspective i saw a lot that 
um, they had all the exploration deeds, so like, it was so easy for minstrels, room keepers, lore masters, they just had to go out and like find certain areas in a region, and oh, then they gotcha. would get their trait. Uh -huh. But like, yeah. for champions and guardians, they had to do all the like advanced slayers and those took hours <laughs> interesting it kind of reminds me i don't know if you ever played star wars galaxies uh the mmo yeah. but early early on if i recall correctly in order to unlock jedi or at least like the ability to to level into it each account had its own random seed for which skills you had to level into or it was something along those lines uh, so obviously that's a more oh my e gosh. extreme example but i could still imagine the I guess different people could respond to it in different ways, but I know for me, if I'm, because I, I like character building, if I have a specific build or trajectory for a character, and if the game doesn't tell me early on how to get there, I could find myself being a little frustrated at that. Right. Uh, but, but uh, I'm, yeah, I'm glad to your point that it has been changed. And in fact, I think it was. I was playing um, today earlier, in fact, and mm -hmm. there was a deed. I'm playing a human captain and nice. there was a a trait i believe i'm still learning the terminology mm -hmm. that i had to kill a certain amount of words and i got i forget whatever yes. the, the stat was but to your point i knew ahead of time how to get it and what the reward was going to be so i could make the choice as a player whether or not i you know wanted to make that trade off um right so i could only imagine if it was random <laughs> and yeah. you spend how many minutes or hours or play sessions doing this and you realize this is going in the wrong direction for you know your preference uh, so right that's awesome any other features that come to mind in terms terms of recent either like developmental priorities or content or uh, combat adjustments that you've really enjoyed compared to how you re recall and remember and experienced Lotra in the past? Um, well, combat wise, it's changed a lot. That's something I never really followed, honestly, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of funny because I feel like it's super important, but I always played and I would just click buttons and hope I wouldn't die. But now lately I've been getting more involved with like, all right, this is what stats are. And, you know, I need to know this stuff. <laughs> sure. So, yeah. Uh -huh. um, that's mostly how my play style was for several years. But um, the combat definitely has changed. It's a lot. I think it's just a lot more. Um, I think there are less skills that are. It's not that like um, easy to pick up anymore to, i guess to kind of understand that there are less skills like if i if i pulled up like an old screen of my old character back when um turbine had lotro like back in the mm -hmm. early days i feel like there was a lot more skills than there are now and i like that there's less to learn because okay. of that uh -huh. but um at the same time it kind of does it it makes things a little too easy now so it's a in mixed terms bag. of over tuned <laughs> in terms of like skills do more and yeah thus. yeah okay I, interesting I, I feel like um there would be like separate skills that only did like maybe one singular thing and now mm -hmm. skills have like multiple different like buffs or they just have way too many like um they have too many different like buffs apparently <laughs> or interactions you know I mean? or yeah. different ways you could layer effects and yeah thank you yeah no, that's interesting because yeah. uh, I remember early in my uh, uh, captain's experience, and I was paying, I was trying to pay attention to game balance. And my auto attack at the time, I think, was doing only ten percent of what my direct damage melee attack could do. <laughs> yeah. And so now this was still early on, but it, it kind of gave me a signal as to where the the balance was heading. Now uh, I have a one hundred and five warden, but admittedly, I used one of the the. Uh, leveling like the valor items yeah i used mm -hmm. one of them i think i got it last year during their big um 15 year anniversary uh but i wanted to play from the beginning so i rolled like this captain and mm -hmm. i within i forget i must have been like level 10 and i was already doing like a thousand damage with uh one of one of the malay skills and I, I thought that was interesting in comparison with yeah. um i don't know maybe 75 per auto attack so i see what you mean yeah. in terms of one skill being able to perhaps compared to the past this one dd is worth you know two or three skills versus right it by itself right now right yep yeah i i i'm really going based off of memory when i say this but i i do oh, sure. think that that was the case for sure mm -hmm. i feel like they've dropped a couple of skills with some of the reworks that they've done in the future 
Yeah, and part of me doesn't mind fewer number of skills as long as the mm -hmm. interactions remain interesting. Like I think of early EverQuest. I don't know if you have ever played early EverQuest or the no. uh, like the private servers like um, Project 1999 or there's an Alcabor. But anyways, mm -hmm. it, like spellcasters, for example, could only slot eight, I believe eight or nine spells. And those were your skills. Then oh my gosh. Guild Wars 1, actually. Did you ever play Guild Wars 1? No. I, I haven't played a lot of other MMOs, uh, honestly. It's only been like Star Wars The Old Republic and Lord of the Rings online. <laughs> no, that, that's fine. I'm trying to think if there's... Uh, Star Wars, I guess, is fairly close to Lord of the Rings. There's like maybe... Yeah. Tw uh, like at, at max level, there's about like 20 or so skills or something based off yeah. my memory. There, there wasn't too many, uh, but it's interesting thinking back... Uh, with these classic titles, and they had far fewer skills to, or buttons to click, but each interaction was really, really important. And right. so whether or not you chose to use this skill versus one of the other seven really, really made a difference uh, versus spreading out, what, eight skills and then down into 25 or maybe 30. Uh, it, it's just been interesting to see how the genre has evolved. Um, something yeah. I want to circle back to, mm -hmm. you mentioned one reason why you cover Lotro is partially legacy and nostalgia, um, which is completely valid. Like still to my favorite, or uh, to this day, my favorite MMO to play is Early EverQuest. Um, I have covered it briefly on my channel. Uh, it takes so much time to do anything though. Uh, so uh -huh. it, there's like this practical side that it's, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to balance that. But anyways, um, in terms of other titles that you could cover or you could stream, I suppose in this context, it'd be um, Star Wars The Old Republic. Why yeah. do you consider, or why do you prefer, hmm, why do you like, why do you enjoy covering Lotro in addition to your your history with the game? Um. Well, <laughs> I don't know how to, I don't know how to say this without being a little mean sounding, but um, Star Wars: The Old Republic, the fan base is a little too aggressive sometimes for my liking. Yeah. <laughs> and Lord of the Rings Online, I never had that issue like ever. I mean, there have been situations, sure, and there's always like one bad apple, but it's never been to the extent with Star Wars stuff. So. Um, that's kind of the main reason, because I actually had a YouTube channel, um, it was like, not my face or anything like that, where I just made Star Wars edits, Yeah. and it was, it went really popular, like, I had over, like, 2,000 subs, so oh, it was, yeah. it was a great time, but, like, the comments, sometimes people would just bash my ideas oh, of theories, and, yeah. yeah, it happens with anything, but, sure. um, I think that I was just so like obsessed with Star Wars because I'm a huge Star Wars nerd. Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> so when I would hear like people's feedback, I'm like, no, this is my theory. Like, let me like say what I have to say. And yeah. with Lord of the Rings, I never had that issue. Like always in the community. It's such a great community because I always felt welcomed. Like I've tried to, I've been invited to like some charity events on Twitch stuff for Lotro. Oh, that's cool, yeah. Yeah, and like, uh, it's just such a great, it's almost like a smaller and like more impactful community because it's more like intertwined with a, like a smaller branch of people. So that's mostly my main reason why I really appreciate to stream and um, do Lord of the Rings online content. No, that's that's awesome. Um, yeah. and it, it That makes a ton of sense because content creation is a communal enterprise. <laughs> For those yeah. who haven't done it before, it's very social and <laughs> yeah. That makes it complete sense now that I think about it. I haven't made that connection as, as internally in, until you you really highlighted that. Thank you. Now, yeah. with respect to community, do you think there's overlap between your, uh, how do I say this? Do you think that Lotro's community is also one of its greatest features? There's probably a better way to say that. In other words, is that one major reason why you think it still maintains its its active player base as a result of it, the quality of its community? Yes. I, I honestly, I think that's one thing that Lotro probably needs to pay more attention to, or at least do a little oh. bit more improvement on is with the community. Cause I feel like we are, we are like tight knit 
But yeah. I almost feel like it's so separate from Standing Stone games sometimes. Like they're kind of doing their own streams, like on their official um, like Twitch channel, and they'll allow like other Lotro players to go on there and such. But other than that, like that's about it. And then they have the forums, but I want something where it's just a little more like they have more community events going on in the game. Like they have a couple, but I think there there could be more because I know a lot of players that do their own. And that's great, but I just wish that they had more opportunities or maybe like challenges that would allow more people in the game to get together with some of the developers. I think that that would probably be a better thing of feedback and improvement for them. Interesting. So let me make sure I'm, I'm tracing this properly. Yeah. So you're not necessarily, and you jump in and correct me here at, at any point if I'm misrepresenting, I'm just, this is really interesting. So are you saying not so much that they need more like holiday seasonal fest, uh, festivals like they just had for their uh, 16 year anniversary. Um, and it's not so much that they get in the way of player run activities like i think there's an annual or biannual like music festival in lotro <laughs> that i uh, in, i'm sure yeah maybe, yeah that, there's that, a that's lot of band been, events that, that's so cool and so it's not so much that they prohibit or they work against that but rather they're being more of a i guess a community with the developers themselves yes. from the perspective of players yeah, in my opinion, that's how I feel like it is. Um, I think you said that so perfectly. Um, yeah, because I, I, yeah, they do have like the festivals and stuff, and those are great. I love those. Don't get me wrong. I'm always down to play a festival. Though, um, I wish that they would highlight or maybe just promote or market like some of the other mm. player led things that are happening and get do you have more any involved examples? with them. Yeah, so I guess in this regard, so what happened that i totally missed one day but there was a band event someone uh there was like a huge um i guess like musical band that went on in the green fields in lotro okay. and this went on for like six hours or so i think they played music i think uh it was like 90s music or something That's and awesome. it was it was great they were streaming it all over twitch like people were loving it the community like posted it all over but i never saw the devs ever address it or like try to promote it on like mm. their social medias like try mm -hmm. to at least help some of those people to get even more visibility yeah sure. and i wish that there was more options or opportunities where the devs would kind of do that no that makes sense because one item that comes to mind mostly from like again uh, an, an outsider perspective mm -hmm. is when i think about mmo communities that i've dipped my toes into over the years as i you know i the mmo genre is my favorite gaming genre um, and so I've dipped around quite yeah. a bit over the course of my life. The community-led elements of Lotro, other than, I'm trying to think, like, have you ever heard of the MMO Ryzen? Uh, I've heard of it, but I know nothing about it. <laughs> I, there, uh, and it's, it's, it's difficult to even make a comparison because Lotro, to my knowledge, has a very robust music system that players take yeah. advantage of. But other than some community driven activity in Ryzen. And there's, I guess, some role playing servers with like old school Neverwinter Nights um, games. <laughs> but anyways, um, that's one of the unique components of Lotro. When I think about, OK, uh, you know, what separates each title from others? And immediately that comes to mind is not only Lotro's community, but also what the community does with the different things within the game, uh, like these music festivals. So it right. would make sense if the developers or the community manager, or the marketing team leaned into that, because in my mind, like, I don't know if you can do that type of thing in World of Warcraft or even like New World. Um, I know that Black Desert Online has a music system, but I hmm. haven't come across anything near like the, the different musical, like the yearly, um, uh, I don't know what it's called, but it's at least once a year, right? Where a bunch of different bands in game perform for an audience in Lotro. Yeah. Do, do you have anything you want to add to that? Just a, just like one more quick thing um, yeah. in regards to like Standing Stone and marketing. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who is like a marketing specialist in yeah, uh, real true. estate, yes. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that that's one thing that um, that could always be improved upon for any mm -hmm. game, honestly. And Standing Stone, I think that they could improve it by 
like you say, kind of just showcasing like some of the community led events. Mm -hmm. And yeah, by perfect example, by promoting like more um, like annual band um, tours and stuff, because people are having like tours on different servers and it's crazy. And it, it, yeah, I've never seen anything like that on any other MMO that I'm aware of. So I think that that's like a great marketing thing on their end and it helps both parties out because the community will get more attraction for all the band players who take time to rehearse and all of that. And then also Standing Stone will get more marketing and potentially more visibility for Lotro. So that's overall right. like a good, yeah, that's an overall thing of feedback I would offer. No, that's excellent. Now, for someone who may not be aware of this, mm -hmm. these traveling bands within Lotro, what exactly do you mean? And perhaps I'm asking the question for myself, because <laughs> I know <laughs> there there is this festival, and I don't know if it's every year or biannually, or, or if the community just determines it ad hoc. Um, but you mentioned yeah. like there are groups of players that will literally go on tour within the individual game servers. Yeah, so um, I'm not aware of any like yearly um, band like tour that I know that has like a name to it. It seems to be like certain um, players will have like a group like in the Discord maybe, and then they all will go on certain servers at certain times and different days, and then they'll play at a certain location. They'll promote it in like Lotro forums. What they typically do is. Um, They'll take like maybe like themes. Like I know um, my good friend who I'm gonna shout out here, TD, he's a part of a 18 player band, I believe. And he comes in my chats and he'll tell me like what the band schedule is and then they actually stream it on Twitch. So that way you can at least see it if you're not on the server. But yeah, they'll they'll typically um, kind of just take like any 80s, 90s music and then um, they'll broadcast it and then play it for a certain amount of hours and yeah it's become like its own community in itself i don't partake in it too much so i'm not sure how they plan everything but sure. um they'll have weekly schedules that come out in the forum so you just gotta players... have to keep an eye out yeah absolutely sorry i didn't mean to cut you off no you're good so i over here on my other monitor i, mm -hmm. I did a quick search and it seems like there is a annual music event called Weatherstock. Does that come to mind? Yes, yeah. Uh, I see a lot. Yeah, so Weatherstock's kind of like a, lo um, a location within Lowlands and Lotro, but I do okay. see a lot of bands play at Weatherstock. Okay, interesting. Okay, gotcha. Fascinating. Yeah. And then to clarify, the bands play through Lotro's music system. It's not like they're yeah. just funneling audio from Spotify. It's Correct. There's, there's a, a real skill involved by and i still need to learn how to do it because before my time in tech i was a professional musician actually but you actually have to perform the music as a band together using lotro's built-in music system it, it's 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 actually a uh an artistic uh expression with legitimate skill right yeah so i think that what most people do for like special songs um that aren't like composed by them like using lotro system but i think what they do is they almost like take like a mod so that um someone has to go through the time and energy of kind of like putting the like music together mm -hmm. and like put it in with lotro's music system and all that so there are ways like you could go online and like find like maybe like oh yeah a lotro piece of this 90s song and then plop it into the music system with the mm -hmm. mod. Um, that's, I think, how most people go about doing it. That's so interesting. That's cool. I'll yeah. have to check that out at some point. Because I know there's an instrument system. I don't know too much about that, but there may be even a deeper music uh, component that I'll have to check out. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, um, there's so many instruments in the game. I've lost track. <laughs> oh, sure. No, I, I actually, I, I'm the more I dive in, the more I admire it, because it also feels very lore friendly and immersive uh yes. music I, I don't i don't know if you've read uh tolkien but uh even his earlier uh like um there and back again the hobbit i mean it's full of songs and poetry and, and music and so for the developers to make that a bona fide system to me just honors the legacy uh, of of the ip yeah it's fantastic i love how they put the music system together and i've definitely heard that it's like no other so 
I love it. I, I I love all the music stuff. I hope the Lotro music people who are, are listening, I hope they keep doing what they're doing. They're doing great. <laughs> oh, sure. Totally. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> um, and I'm sure if, if, if any of the music veterans are, are listening, let us know where we're getting this wrong or uh, yes. how we can better represent you. Cause I'm speaking certainly as an outsider in this topic, but I, I do celebrate. I think it's awesome. Um, I'm so, an outsider in this topic too. It's okay. <laughs> it, yeah. Two ignorant people talking about this specific, yeah. specific thing. No problem. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious. So beyond, beyond the music, beyond the community, are there any other gameplay either it's a mechanic or if it's a feature or it's an overlay of features that to you is Lotro's biggest gameplay draw or maybe stickiness in terms of why playing Lotro or why uh, yeah playing Lotro is more enjoyable versus playing literally anything else for me the biggest game well maybe not gameplay draw for me the best thing about lotro is because mm -hmm. it does stick to the lore from what i've mm -hmm. heard mm -hmm. i haven't read the books unfortunately i know i need to i need to do it um <laughs> but i think that that's one thing that makes people kind of really into lotro because it does pretty much stick to some lore and you learn a lot like i've learned a lot about other things that are barely touched on in the movies. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that that's one big draw uh, in terms of like combat and such. I don't necessarily, I think it's almost the same for the most part in comparison to other MMOs from my assumption. Uh, I don't think there's anything really too special there though. I think it's mostly just the community aspect of it. The fandom of Lord of the Rings and actually sticking to the lore. And overall, I just think it's a really enjoyable, relaxed MMO. And I think that's probably one of the best draws to it, in my opinion. Like, I don't really sweat too much playing Lord of the Rings. And it's nice to kind of just play and, you know, let my mind go on autopilot. And I hear a lot of people say the same thing. So I think that's mostly um, the good part about it. And it's a little more grindy, too. Um, and also for the fact of a lot of the content that you have is pretty much free. Like you don't have to pay anything to play it, which I think is also another big draw because I mm -hmm. never bought a membership or a subscription for it. I only did it like three times ever. And I only did it because it was just more convenient. Sure, <laughs> and every yeah. time I did it, I was like, I didn't really need this because I have all the expansions. I have all the quest packs. And then if I'm a free to play player, yeah, you do hit like a cap where you do need to buy the quest packs at like level 95 or 100. But mm -hmm. if you grind enough, you'll get the points so you can buy all that. And I like doing that personally. I liked yeah. getting the reward. So I think that that's the biggest draw to it, maybe just also that it's really not like this big like paywall that people mm -hmm. think. So um, that's a really neat thing about Lotro. Oh, totally. Yeah. So you brought up three things and i'm yeah. going to do my best to to uh, <laughs> shoot an arrow each of those no 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 no. that's no that it's excellent so the first regarding tolkien's world and the world building yeah what's fascinating is i asked in the lotro reddit why people play lotro versus some other mmo or other game overwhelmingly they said the exact same thing and i remember reading their comments somewhat not necessarily confused. I don't know if skeptical is the right word, but when thinking back uh, before I really seriously dove into Lotro, there hasn't been a game that the world building itself is what captured me. Now, early EverQuest would be an exception to that, but mm -hmm. I think it's similar to you in terms of it was my first MMO. So just the magic of, you know, an NPC or something that I, that normally in a game would be an NPC, but it's actually a, another human player behind that. That is just yeah. earth shattering when I was like 12, whenever yeah. you know it came out, um, revealing, revealing my age a little bit here. But anyways, um, me too but, it's okay <laughs> but uh, when i started playing um lotro and i took a moment to appreciate the world building it finally clicked and i understood and i'm beginning to understand now why that's such a compelling reason uh, one example is in the new zone uh that was released with the most recent kind of mini expansion um, I'm forgetting the name of that, the very first one, um, but there's a little idyllic town in which your character starts. I think it's like Mossword or something. I'm, uh, yeah. The, the lore junkie here is, are, are going to correct me here. Uh, but what what blew my mind, 
and this is what, like I said, kind of tipped the bottle, was I in the blacksmith's house, I believe it's the blacksmith house, um, who's a, a dwarf, um, and kind of plays a recurring theme throughout the, the initial quest. In his bedroom is a picture of the door that enters into Moria. Yeah. And now I don't know too much about the particular character and if they've done any traveling, uh, but that like subtle detail, like you don't have to go back into the person's room. Um, the character itself, like in the dialogue, to my knowledge, didn't refer it, re reference that at all. But the world, basically the world taking itself seriously and that just being one example of it, that you have this dwarf who is, I don't know how many miles separated from their, you know, legendary uh, uh, home community. And one little glimpse into maybe what the dwarf thinks about at night or something was this, the 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 uh, door that, that kind of represents home, uh, despite being, you know, very, very far away. Um, and then there were other examples that reiterate that same thing in terms of the developers really did an, a fantastic job representing Middle Earth in the context of an MMO. I have read that there are there is also a professor who also hosts a class once a year or so using Lotro as an example for uh, Tolkien literature. Uh, That's and awesome. So that, it, exactly. <laughs> so um, and so at, even playing uh, like with my warden going through Mordor, then like um, Gondor and Rohan, uh, there are absolutely gorgeous, like not, not only is the world building gorgeous, but yeah. like the, the storytelling, just the way the developers have crafted the world or the way they tease like upcoming ruins, it really draws you in. Um, and so that, that made a lot of sense um, in terms of your answer and also how that corroborates the responses from all these other individuals um, who replied to my question as well. Now, another item you brought up was not only from your perspective, is the monetization incredibly generous? But you also snuck in this comment about there being potential confusion from looking from the outside in terms of Lotro being expensive or it being cumbersome or it being difficult to get into with respect to its monetization. Is there any clarity you want to provide to someone who is who's listening and they do have that perception, but um, in reality, it may be something different? I, I've played this game for free for, we'll say at least 11 years, at least, probably more. I know people who stream on the Lotro stream, like the official Twitch stream, that have never paid a dime and have hmm. access to all the in-game content. So mm -hmm. there's proof of people who have never had to um, put any sort of monetary value into Lotro who have played it for several years and they're able to get access into all of the content. So that's my biggest takeaway for anyone who's listening who was like, oh, there's a paywall or I don't want to get into it because of the paywall. Like, yeah, I, I, I guess. I almost like to think of it like a soft paywall where, mm -hmm. yeah, once you get to level 100, you can pay to get a subscription and then get access to all the in-game content. But if you take the route that I took and just grind the game and make a couple dozen characters and do a lot of deeds, you'll get there. So that's my and only even, thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah. And, and to your point, if the wall becomes increasingly less soft by the time you're level 100 <laughs> and, and for a Lotro context, you don't blitz through levels like in Black Desert Online where you're level what, like uh, 54 in like a couple of hours. Right. I don't know how many <laughs> hours... Uh, on my captain, he's not even level 20, and I probably have spent at least 20 hours on him alone. And sure, I wasn't like grinding and speed leveling, but it, th there's definitely a journey involved. So if you actually get a, to a character legitimately to level 100, uh, and it's free, the amount of hours to do that, I don't know what it would be off the top of my head, but the that's a pretty insane value comp for free. Yeah, I can actually offer a little bit of clarity because someone just asked me this the other day. Oh, so yeah. for leveling and how long it takes to level, uh, I started streaming a Runekeeper two years ago when I first started streaming, like ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I stream once a week, give or take a couple weeks, you know, time off from stream schedule, it, it stuff happens. But I've been streaming uh, pretty consistently for 
average of three hours once a week for two years, the same mm -hmm. the character, mm -hmm. and they're only at level 75. My total time in the game, it says that I've had um, a play time of one week's worth and one day and like, I think it was like 12 hours. So <laughs> I put a lot of hours into this one character and they're still not even close to level 100. So. <laughs> And that week is full twenty four hours. Yeah, yeah, that was so a full twenty four. We're talking 24. what? What? Uh, almost two hundred hours. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Several hours just for the one character. Just for one character. <laughs> sure, totally. And yeah. you're what you said seventy five. So yep. three quarters of the way in terms of level, but not necessarily right. in terms of time. Right. That's awesome. No, that's a great illustrative example. I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Um, mm -hmm. Now I'm curious, and I don't know, some people could view this as a, a con, others as a pro, but in terms of like length of leveling, now I personally am in the group that I like longer durations between levels because it makes it feel more impactful. But this kind of ties into the, not necessarily with the length of the levels, but that the, like a secondary consequence of that is that it does feel like a journey and it does feel like you are a character within Middle Earth versus um, there being some sort of skip feature, even though, even though there are those like level, those Valor, like you mentioned. Um, but with respect to issues in Lotro, I do know that you brought up the kind of marketing side, which is kind of like a, an outside of the game kind of component. But in terms of like an in-game, either a mechanic or a secondary effect of a feature. What do you think Lotro's biggest issue is? Now, I am familiar with people who, and I've actually experienced it myself in terms of the server lag, so that immediately comes to mind. Um, but I'm curious if you have, because of your long history playing Lotro, um, is there anything that jumps out in terms of uh, the developers needing to, to really emphasize on something? I've had a lot of people tell me that the, um, like the UI, the UX design needs to get um, redone, and mm -hmm. it's something that me personally I never had an issue with. But now that it's been pointed out to me, like scaling wise, because the resolution is just terrible mm -hmm. for people who have larger monitors, like mm -hmm. on your character portrait, that is something that I wish that they would redo or fix at some point. Okay. Um, I think that's overall kind of it. I think some of like the smaller things that you'll kind of run into sometimes is that sometimes quests don't progress. And so I, I just had this happen the other day. I completed a quest twice and it didn't progress. So oh, I had to submit a ticket. Yeah, oh, wow. but that's like so huh. rare. It does sure, happen sure. every once in a while. So, it, you know, it, it kind of affects the gameplay because some of my characters get stuck, but... <laughs> sure, if there's a chain, it, yeah, no, that yeah. does make sense. I don't know if I've encountered that, but I'll be on the lookout. It's only that, with this one minor, quest. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's, so it's, it's, it's with few the and one far between. Yeah, it, it's... I've only had it happen with the same quest once, and it's like a level 40 or so quest, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, though I think that's honestly it mostly. Um, I think one thing too, just general feedback, and like, I this happens, so it, it's not even on them. Like, I'm not trying to call them out, but um, what happens sometimes with some of the newer things that they come out with, they don't really have any sort of plan for people who are kind of stuck in the middle. So for an example, mm. I had a dwarf guardian who was working on their legendary item. Um, and that's like a level 50, like milestone essentially. So in your quest chain and the story quest chain, you had to get your legendary item up to level 10 before you could access Moria. And then the um, game developers, they launched this new essentially like legendary item um like progress like they completely reworked it all and now mm -hmm. legendary items have to be bought at the specific location so what happened to me and i, I still have this issue to this day <laughs> is um because they didn't plan for characters who are currently in that quest chain and they didn't have like some uh, of a backup plan yeah. my character is completely stuck i can't no. access any story quest i can't get into moria and because i didn't access this legendary item quest to even get my legendary item i can't get into the area to even purchase a legendary item so i just oh wish that they God. had more <laughs> yeah i'm, I'm totally stuck 
I like submit. I've submitted like two tickets, and they're like, they're like, well, can't you just like have one of your other characters port you? And I'm like, I, I mean, I guess, but like, can I just get in this area? You know? Yeah. So it's, it's a. Uh, I wish that's happened with some of their newer changes, where some of my characters do get stuck because they're kind of in this area where, okay, like we're rolling this out, but you're kind of in this awkward area where you just can't progress. Are there things that you have to start completely from scratch when other people don't have to because they were just right at that sweet spot? So I wish that they would just plan a little more thoroughly for some of their newer releases. But I mean, this happens to anyone, so it's not just them, but it, it definitely sucks. Yeah, no, that's a totally valid uh, criticism to have because you would expect players who are part of the legacy system for there to be logic within the game update to update either their their status or their permissions like you said you have apparently the game checks yeah. for a legendary item at a certain level but that's not relevant anymore or uh, you know, the, the yeah. details of what i'm saying could uh or the the specific terms could be changed but anyways um no that that certainly makes sense um so beyond the ui and <clears throat> beyond the maybe an additional forethought with respect to developers does to you is lotro in a good state as an mmo this is such a difficult question because if we were to do this like two days ago i would have said yes but um amazon games came out and said that they're probably going to do their own lord of the rings mmo mm -hmm. in the same time period so mm -hmm. um i am definitely worried about lotro state right now because of that because mm -hmm. Amazon is a really big, Amazon Games is such a big name, so they have like mm -hmm. the marketing power and stuff behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Lotro is in a great state right now, but once this new game, if it, if it does come out, um, once that comes out, I'm, I'm very, very nervous for the state of Lotro. I don't think that people are really gonna remain because it'll be, almost compared to this new Amazon games, L sure. Lord of the Rings MMO. Sure. And I think just graphics wise and all of that with Lotro, people probably don't play Lotro because they take one look at the graphics. They're like, oh my goodness, this is so outdated. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people will start to compare. And um, I think that'll be a future issue down the road. Absolutely. So internally, in terms of Lotro by itself, other than the, the two issues you, you described earlier, internally, it feels good. Like you said, like two days ago, the the context was different versus yeah. existentially. Now with very specific competition, comparatively, uh, yeah. they they need to figure out what their, their battle plan is, huh? Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, I think Lotro, like just with the game and, and how it is right now, I mean, yeah, there's always room for improvements for it. But I think overall, it's a fantastic game. I love playing it. I know personally, for me, like, I'm not going to stop for a while. So <laughs> it's just got this great, like, energy about it. And I can't mm -hmm. explain it about any other MMO with, like, just some of the strategy parts of the game. So, yeah, I think in that regard, it's like, yes, Lotro is a great MMO. It's in a great state for that matter. But yeah, externally, it's um, it's looking a little grim in the future. <laughs> sure. And it's, it would be interesting if we actually had this conversation two days ago to see what your answer would be. Uh, <laughs> right. So no, why should a veteran, and I suppose I could label you that, sorry if you don't identify with being a veteran of Lotro, but <laughs> why would it, or why should a veteran keep playing Lotro? And why should someone new try it? Why a veteran should keep playing Lotro is mm -hmm. simply because they're coming out with new things. I mean, we're probably going to get a new class by the end of the year with a new expansion and they'll probably increase the level cap. So mm -hmm. in the meantime, just keep grinding other characters. So that's my main advice for like veterans, why they should keep playing it. Uh, new players, I think the thing that's hard for newer players and what can be quite overwhelming. And this is a someone who's, you know, taken maybe a year or two off from playing Lotro. It happens. Um, but every time I come back, I would feel very overwhelmed because hmm. especially as a new player, you're starting from scratch. Everyone else is pretty much ahead. But mm -hmm. I would just say, don't think about how much you're going to have to learn with the game because that can be overwhelming. Take it one step at a time. 
um, definitely just just play the game. That's what I did. Just just mindlessly hit buttons, and you'll figure out the rest <laughs> later. That's how I did it. I mean, Learning by doing, sure. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, how, we, how, we, just, how we learn to walk and crawl. You you make some mistakes, you try it out. Yeah. Exactly. Like tune out the rest of the world. Don't look at the world chat. Don't you know? Don't think about. Oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. Like just just turn that off and just start mashing buttons. If you die, hey, it happens to everyone. You know, you'll revive. It's okay. And I think it's just overall, um, just for new players to kind of get into Lotro, it's just an overall great community. I love it. I think that they're always coming out with new stuff, like I've mentioned. And I think because of that, it's definitely an active MMO and just overall community based. There's just so many different areas in Lotro you can kind of specialize in. So like if you wanted to fish in Lotro, I know people who do a lot of fishing in Lotro and that's it. Some people like to be in the band so you can kind of like take that world in lord of the rings and kind of make it your own so that's a really good thing i wanted to highlight no that's awesome um so i want to honor your time again thank you so so much for the conversation now before <laughs> thanks we for end, having me though, oh anytime uh <laughs> where can people find you in your content yeah so um i'm always posting some guides um or even tips for veteran players but specifically for new players on youtube so you can find me at aubrey the weird one on youtube and then i also stream on twitch i stream lotro at least one day a week right now it's tuesdays so you can check me out there at aubrey the weird one as well and it's all it's all lowercase and everything's spelled out there's no number one it's just spelled with o-n-e at the end so Yep, that's mostly what I'm doing right now. Um, I appreciate you for having me on again. Thank you. Oh, not a problem.